No, I you're do see to, it. You're good to go, Bob. Oh. Hello and welcome to PMP Live. I'm Bob Batardi, Deputy Director of Programs with Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us today for the world-renowned bird expert and author David Allen Sibley, here to talk about his new book, What It's Like to Be a Bird. David is the author of The Essential Guide to Birding, The Sibley Guide to Birds, the fastest selling bird book in history, earning him the moniker, The Beetle of Birding Among the Press. First, a little bit about this program. In this new online format, Politics and Prose can continue to bring you the authors you love and their new books, even though we miss your smiling faces in person and at our stores throughout DC. At any time during the event, you can click on the green button below to purchase David Sibley's new book on the Politics and Prose website. Even though our physical stores are closed, our online business has ramped up and your continued purchases at Politics and Prose will enable us to continue to bring you these kinds of events and programming. Tonight, you can ask the author a question by clicking on Ask a Question, that is a box below, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. You can also read other people's questions and even vote for your favorites. A reminder that unlike our in-person events, the author, host, and audience members cannot see you. So relax, enjoy, and be prepared for a real treat. Finally, we wanna thank you for being here with us today. We're so thankful for our community of loyal customers that continues to show up to keep our business and our spirits thriving. This is truly a book for curious birders and non-birders alike that will provide a deeper understanding of what common, mostly backyard birds are doing and why. You might wonder, can birds smell? Is this the same cardinal that was at my feeder last year? Do robins hear worms? In What It's Like to Be a Bird, David Sibley answers the most frequently asked questions about the birds that we see most often. This special large format volume is geared as much to non-birders as it is to the out and out obsessed, covering more than 200 species and including more than 330 new illustrations by the author. For David, this has been a lifelong interest since childhood, where he grew up in Connecticut with his father, a Yale University ornithologist, and had many formative experiences in his youth, like meeting Roger Tory Peterson, author of The Peterson Guides. David has produced over 10,000 illustrations across his series of successful guides and has described sketching as an interview with a bird. We're thrilled to hear about his life's observations and enjoy his amazing illustrations in this fascinating new book, What It's Like to Be a Bird, From Flying to Nesting, Eating to Singing, What Birds Are Doing and Why. Along with the millions of bird watchers who will get to enjoy the book in the years to come, you now have firsthand introduction to David's many interviews with birds. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome from his home in Deerfield, Massachusetts, David Sibley. Hi. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, coming out tonight. Um, it's not a real book signing event, but it's the next best thing. So uh, I hope we can all enjoy a, an hour or so together talking about birds. Um, so I'm gonna show some PowerPoint slides in a minute, and uh, I think you'll hopefully be able to see them and me at the same time. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the book and some of the details that are in the book. Um, and then there'll be time for some questions. Um, so let me get my, my slides started. So hopefully you can see a, a, another screen with um, my PowerPoint slides. So this book, um, it started out as an idea for a children's book. Um, 
I wanted to do a guide that would introduce kids to the most familiar birds of the backyard, um, as well as things like puffins and roadrunners and eagles, things that might they might not you might not see in a backyard, but that everyone's heard of and knows about. Um, and I wanted the book to be big, colorful, sort of action-packed, um, kind of the thinking back to the books that I really enjoyed when I was a kid. And I wanted it to include information about what the birds were doing and some explanations of the science, the adaptations, just um, what it's like to be a bird. There's no way to know, obviously, but <laughs> I'm trying to get at some of the things that birds do, some of their amazing abilities. And the more I research those things, I learned so much. A lot of the things that I thought I knew turned out to be wrong. And the truth was even more amazing and more interesting. Um, so this first image is a painting in the book of a chimney swift, which is a familiar Eastern bird found all over the Eastern US. They nest in chimneys in towns. People see them all the time, but a lot of their life is unknown. Um, there's a lot of unanswered questions. And one of the unanswered questions about chimney swift is what they do all winter. Um, they spend the winter in the Amazon in South America, but it's possible that they spend the entire winter flying and never land. So they might spend six or even eight months of the year in the air, sleeping, eating, doing everything in the air. Um, and so that's what this painting is about, trying to capture that feeling of um, just living in the air. Um, this is sort of another painting from the book, sort of channeling my my 10-year-old self, <laughs> the coolest things birds do. So a Western kingbird attacking a red-tailed hawk. And I got to do fun drawings like this one, a hypothetical race involving a roadrunner, a coyote, and a few other competitors. And you can find the explanation in the book. I won't... Uh, go into that too much here, and trying to really capture the beauty of birds like cormorants that don't often make the list of most beautiful birds, but they are gorgeous in a close view. So this book is really kind of my, my own celebration of birds, my own, um, it's really a collection of the things that excite, excited me most about birds. Um, this drawing is illustrating a, a starling taking a bath. And I was trying to answer the question, why birds take baths? It turns out nobody knows for sure, but there are many possible reasons. And one of the likely reasons is that um, uh, if you take a feather that's been bent and get it wet and let it dry, it dries in its normal shape. It's it's normal, correct shape is restored simply by getting it wet and letting it dry. And in a way, it's like us with, with bedhead. <laughs> you wake up in the morning, your hair is sticking out in every direction. You take a shower and brush your hair, and it dries the way you want it. For birds, they take a bath, they preen, and their feathers are straight again. Um, so this is a belted kingfisher. It's a familiar bird in lots of places and a very popular bird. Um, and I'm gonna use the kingfisher as an example to talk about some, some examples of things that are in the book. Um, and in particular, this one illustration from the book shows a kingfisher hovering. Uh, kingfishers catch their food, they catch fish by hovering over the water, maybe 10, 20, 30 feet up, looking into the water, finding a fish, and then diving headfirst into the water to catch that fish. And if you watch a kingfisher when it's hovering, it's holding its position in the air. Um, and in order to do that, it's, it's flapping, it's flailing, kind of fanning its tail, moving its body around, shifting position, adjusting to air currents. And through all of that, its head is staying absolutely still. 
It has its eye fixed on something in the water and it is not moving its head. So they're holding their position in the air well enough so that they, no matter how much their body is bouncing around in the wind and all of the effort to keep themselves in the air and hold themselves in that position, they still keep their head perfectly still and their eye fixed on, the, on their target. And think about all the things that go into that ability. It's just incredible that they're able to do that. So that, first of all, they have to be able to fly, obviously. That requires a lot of adaptations and, and uh, uh, abilities. Um, breathing is important because they have to be able to uh, um, not get out of breath while they're doing all that. Sensing what's going on around them, being able to sense the airflow so that they can adjust to it. Balancing to know how their body's moving and keep their body, uh, um, keep their head adjusted to their body. And then vision is a critical part. They have some amazing adaptations of vision. And then once they've got all that information, they have to make the adjustments to keep their head perfectly still. So I'll go through each of those things, but beginning way, way back, this is a dinosaur um, called Anchiornis. Um, and this dinosaur was um, living about 160 million years ago. It had feathers, but it was a dinosaur. Um, and the fossil of this dinosaur is so well preserved that researchers were able to look at it with a microscope and see the pigment granules, the little melanin granules in the feathers, so they could reconstruct the color pattern. So this is, it's my rendition of the best guess of what this dinosaur might have looked like with black and white speckling in the, um, the forearms, the legs, the tail, a gray body and a reddish brown crest. Um, so all birds are dinosaurs. They are the direct descendants of dinosaurs. There were lots of dinosaurs with feathers. Um, the first true birds started to appear about this time or about 10 million years later. Um, and all of the dinosaurs and almost all of the birds were wiped out by the um, meteor that hit the Yucatan about 65 million years ago. That such a catastrophic event, it wiped out 75% of all the species on earth. Uh, all the dinosaurs were gone. Only about three species of birds, it's estimated three, three species of birds survived. And all the birds we see today are the descendants it evolved from those three species over the last 65 million years. Now the evolution of feathers, um, this is the, hypo the, the best guess of the stages in the evolution of feathers. Um, feathers did not evolve from scales. Feathers started as a hollow tube, um, like a bristle. So that's the, the first stage on the left. The second stage, that hollow tube um, branches, the fibers that make up the tube split and form a downy um, feather, which would have formed a kind of fuzz. And at, at these stages, feathers were useful for probably for insulation and also for camouflage or for um, to be colored as a part of a display, some colorful signal. Um, the next stage, the feather develops a central shaft and, and branches. Um, branches coming off each side of that central shaft. Uh, this is similar to like an ostrich plume. Um, and this is the kind of feather that Anchiornis had. Um, and uh, the next stage, those side branches develop their own branches, little tiny uh, branches with hooks. And those hooks help to hold the barbs together. So this forms a much more a sturdier, more solid surface. Um, and this is the adaptation that then allows, makes it possible for feathers to be 
more useful for flight. And the final stage in the evolution of feathers is specialization. The feather on the right is a wing feather from a modern bird, one of the big flight feathers. And that's a, extremely specialized. It's asymmetrical. Um, the shape, there's little um, adaptations of the shape. It's narrower at the tip. It's stiffer on the leading edge and softer at the trailing edge. All adaptations for more efficient flight. Um, so, but feathers are only part of what allows birds to fly. There's so many other adaptations that that allow flight to be possible. Even if we had huge wings, we wouldn't be able to fly the way birds do. Um, our weight balance is wrong. So birds have adapted to have all of their weight, the heaviest parts of their body, the, the muscle and the bones, all um, condensed into one compact central mass. So. The big muscles that power the wings are all in the chest, um, and that's suspended below the wings, which is balanced, so in the center of the body, below the wings. Um, most of the wing is just feathers. It's controlled by bones and tendons, and all the muscles that control that are in the body. The neck is slender and lightweight. The head is lightweight. The bill is very lightweight. Um, so they've done away with teeth and jaws, which are much heavier and would make them really front heavy. Uh, instead, just a lightweight bill. Um, so that's some of the things that allow the kingfisher to fly. Um, now it's, um, it's breathing is fundamentally different from our respiratory system. And this, is something I, I really just learned and it took me a while to figure out, to sort of sort out how to explain this. So I won't go too much into the explanation here because it's it's in the book and it's, it's better to see it with diagrams and, and a clearer explanation there. Um, but um, birds, instead of, so we have lungs that expand when we breathe in, fill with air and uh, tiny blood vessels um, carry oxygen out to the muscles and, and bring carbon dioxide back to be exhaled. So we exhale the carbon dioxide and then we breathe in more fresh air and the process happens again. In birds, their lungs are fixed, they're, they're rigid like a car radiator. Air flows through them um, and there, there are advantages to that because since the lungs don't expand and contract, the membranes for gas exchange can be thinner um, much more efficient. Um, and the birds have a system of air sacs. So I'll go in a little closer. This is a close up, just a schematic diagram of air comes in from the right side of this image. It flows into the air sac at the rear through the lungs, going forward actually, going left to right through the lungs, which are a little purplish here and fill up the front air sac. And when the birds exhale, their body squeezes down on that rear air sac and it pushes fresh air through the lungs again. So this system, um, they're getting fresh air flowing through their lungs on inhale and exhale. Uh, there is, there's no lag. They don't have that, that dead sort of lag time that we have where we exhale used air and breathe in fresh air before we get more oxygen. Birds are constantly getting fresh air through their lungs on inhale and exhale. It makes them incredibly efficient. And so you have never seen a bird that's out of breath. They basically don't get out of breath. If you see a bird that's panting that looks like it's gasping for air, it's really overheated, which is, is something they have trouble with. But Overheating is when they stop and open their bill and pant. They're not out of breath. Um, so this kingfisher is um, uh, doing like the like the Olympic event, the biathlon, where the competitors do cross country skiing, a really high exertion, and then have to sit down and be uh, 
perfectly steady to shoot at a target. The kingfisher is doing that, flapping, holding its position in the air, and at the same time, total concentration on the water below it. But breathing is so easy for them, it's not an issue. Now they have to sense the air around them, but their, their feathers are like a down jacket. It's insulation and streamlining. Um, there's a layer of feathers between them and the air. So how do they sense the air well enough to know what's going on? They have um, specialized feathers called phyloplumes. And several phyloplumes grow at the base of every feather on the bird's body. They're very slender little wispy feathers, and they're connected to um, nerve endings in the skin. So the birds have a really good sense of what's happening with each feather on their body all the time. They can tell whether it's moving up or down, side to side, if, there's, if it's getting pushed or pulled, if there's low air pressure, high air pressure, turbulence, they sense all of those things in their feathers. So they can make adjustments um, probably some, some instinctively, but some probably comes with practice, um, with experience of knowing that, oh, when they feel that, feel that on the back, that means the wings should be pulled in a little bit, um, or whatever. It's, um, so that they have the phyloplumes that help them to sense what's going on. So even though they're covered with a, an insulating, uh, coat of feathers, they still have a very delicate sense of how air is flowing around their body. Now, birds have an incredible sense of balance. Um, this is a black-headed grosbeak related to the rose-breasted grosbeak that we have in the east. Um, and this bird, it's balancing on a slender twig that's probably swaying back and forth, and it's spinning its head around. Birds do this. Um, they do this kind of thing all the time. They stand on one leg, on a twig that's swaying in the breeze. Um, now, they have a balance sensor in their inner ear, just like we do. Um, and they use that. Um, they also have another balance sensor in their pelvis, which is sort of on their lower back. And that is something we don't have. If you try to balance on one leg and um, swing your head from side to side, it's, um, it's extremely difficult <laughs> to stay balanced because your balance sensor is in your head. And if your head's swinging around, you won't be able to keep your balance to know how your body is, how your body is moving. Birds have two separate balance sensors, um, which allows them to track how their body is moving separately from their head. And this is how the kingfisher can monitor how its body is moving in the air and at the same time um, keep its head perfectly still. Now vision is another uh, really incredible sense that birds have. They, birds surpass us in many ways in their vision. Um, one of the ways is that they, um, they process visual information more quickly than we do. So our brains are limited to under 30 frames per second, under 30 pictures per second. If we see images that fast or faster, um, they blur together. We can't process them quickly enough to see each image before the next one shows up. So we see a moving picture, and that's how our movies and videos work as um, uh, a series of pictures flashing by at 27 or 30 images per second. Birds can process twice that fast or more. So if a bird is watching one of our movies, it would see it as a slideshow, <laughs> just a very fast slideshow. It probably wouldn't even look all that fast to a bird. They, they see at um, flycatchers like this Phoebe can see 70 pictures per second or even more. Um, and this is a critical ability that allows them to fly at high speed, dodging around twigs or catching insects in the air. 
uh, which is what flycatchers do for a living. Um, so imagine flying through the air at 20 miles an hour and trying to track a mosquito, follow its path, and catch it out of the air. We wouldn't be able to do it. Everything would be a blur. Um, the flycatchers see so much faster than we do that they can do that. And uh, research showed that the flycatchers, um, they're not just tracking the insect and sort of flying through it and, and flying, flying at it with their mouth open and letting it come into their mouth. They're actually snapping it out of the air with their, with their bill the tips of their mandibles close on it. So imagine flying through the air, tracking a mosquito and then grabbing it out of the air with tweezers. That's what the birds do. Now birds also have a very different um, overall uh, visual experience than we do. So both of our, our eyes are on the front of our head and both eyes focus on the same point we see one spot of detail in each eye and both eyes focus on the same point. So if you look at one word in a sentence or on a computer screen and try to read the words around it without moving your eyes, you can't. Your, your detailed vision is in one tiny spot. And you see in your peripheral vision, a lot of what's going on around you may be almost half of the, the field around you. Um, but not with any detail. You can sense movement or see uh, big changes. But So this is a snipe, this illustration. Um, snipe are among the most extreme in this regard, but their eyes are on the side of their head and they can see 360 degrees around them and 180 degrees overhead without moving. Their eyes are placed so that everything, uh, the entire horizon and the entire sky is visible at the same time. And they see, instead of one point of detail, they see a band of detail along the horizon. Um, so, and that's where danger usually comes from for a snipe. Um, so they can, they rely on camouflage um, for their protection. If they sense danger, um, they see something that looks alarming, they simply freeze and crouch and rely on their protective coloration to keep them hidden. As long as they stay still and their, their camouflage works, they won't be discovered. Um, and while they're doing that, they can still keep their eyes on everything that's going on around them. Without moving, they'll be able to see everything that's going on, everything that's coming toward them. And if a predator gets too close, um, they can uh, use their, uh, their last resort of escape and just take off and fly away. Um, but all birds that have eyes on the sides of their head can see a tremendous amount of what's going on around them. Um, other species, the snipe has a, a band of detail that it sees in a horizontal plane along the horizon. Um, other species like, like eagles, they have two points of detail that they see with each eye and their eyes on the side of their head, they're pointed in different directions. So an eagle is processing four separate points of detail all the time. There's two two points, one in each eye that, that are almost straight ahead, just a little bit off of straight ahead, but they don't, um, they don't have great vision looking straight ahead. They have good vision to the side. And the second point of detail is a little bit farther back, about 45 degrees out. Um, so they're, they're able to scan around them, seeing four different points of detail, as well as almost 360 degrees of peripheral vision. Um, and the way this, what this means is that the, this eagle, the, the head of the eagle here that I've drawn on the left is actually looking straight at you with one eye. It is focused on you 
and really studying you with that one eye. Um, now, another thing about birds and vision is that they um, they they use their vision obviously to see what's going on around them. And one of the best ways to see what's going on around you is to stand perfectly still. If you hold your head perfectly still, you will notice any motion that's happening around you. If you start moving, then things move relative to each other. It's harder to detect motion around you. But if you hold your head perfectly still, um, you sense motion much more easily. And that's actually what pigeons are doing when they bob their heads, we say pigeons bob their heads when they walk, they're actually holding their head perfectly still while they walk and then snapping it forward and holding it still in the next position as their body moves forward underneath it. When they pick up their back foot, the head snaps forward, they take a step and their body moves forward underneath their head. And as they put that foot down and pick up the next foot, their head snaps forward again. Um, so in between each head bob, their head is at a fixed point in space and their eyes are focusing on everything around them to see if there's anything moving, anything out of the ordinary, anything to be worried about um, or any potential food. So this is something that um, pigeons are doing, and it's related to what the kingfisher is doing. Um, um, so the kingfisher is keeping its eye fixed on something in the water and using that, um, it's using different um, points of detail in its eyes to focus on different things at the same time. It's got one, one point fixed on the, um, its target in the water so it's studying that, and at the same time, it's got one eye, one point fixed on some nearby object, and it's using that as a sort of anchor to help hold its position in the air, to know that it's not shifting its position, to, to stay fixed at that point in space. So it's monitoring a couple of different points at the same time. and. Uh, doing what pigeons do with their head bobbing, but doing it in midair. And the final thing that birds, that the kingfisher is doing to make all of that possible is using its long flexible neck to adjust, to compensate, to absorb all of the motion of its body before that motion reaches the head. So all birds have long flexible necks. Um, they're hidden under the feathers, so we don't really see it, but they all have very quite long necks. Um, owls are famous for the folklore is that they can turn their head completely around in a circle. Um, they can't quite do that. Um, they can turn it about 270 degrees, so three quarters of the way around. Um, but all birds can turn their head more than halfway around. And uh, uh, the kingfisher, as it flies, is using its um, long, flexible neck to its, its understanding how its body is moving and adjusting instantaneously, adjusting its neck to compensate as a, as a big shock absorber, to compensate for all the motion of the body so that its head stays perfectly still. All around, it's just an incredible ability, this bird that's flying and sensing the airflow and having no trouble breathing and um, uh, with its eyes fixed on a couple of different things and using its neck to absorb all of the motion of the body before that motion reaches the head. So that's just one, one particular uh, thing that one bird does and examples of some of the adaptations that make it possible. Um, I think that it, you know, I could go on <laughs> for a long time about all these things. The, the thing that I got out of creating this book is, is that birds are even more amazing than I 
had given them credit for. And after 50 years, 50 plus years of watching and studying birds, um, it was really eye-opening for me to realize how much more is going on out there than I knew about. Um, this uh, chickadee is another example I'll, I'll toss in of, um, you know, chickadees, they're, they're constant visitors at bird feeders. They take sunflower seeds. Um, they're one of the most faithful visitors to bird feeders. But when the chickadees have young, when, they're, when their chicks are just hatched and growing, they seek out special kinds of food for the young. So they feed the chicks a lot of insects, a lot of caterpillars, um, lots of insect larvae. And for the first week after the chicks hatch, the adults make a special effort to find spiders. They feed a higher proportion of spiders to the chicks. And spiders are actually high in taurine, which you might have heard of as an essential nutrient for brain development. So the chickadees instinctively know that spiders are good brain food and they should bring spiders to their young. They won't bring sunflower seeds to their young. They'll wait until the young fledge and then bring the young to the bird feeder uh, in the first week or two after they've fledged and show them that this is a good source of food. But while the chicks are in the nest, the adults are, are finding, they're doing a lot of work to find special food. Um, and building nests is just an incredible ability. This oriole is building a nest. It's very likely this is the first time this oriole has ever built a nest. Um, they know how to do it instinctively, but at the same time, um, their uh, instinct is flexible enough and uh, sort of malleable enough that an oriole can choose choose its location based on a lot of different factors. Choose the material that it uses for the nest. Choose when exactly when to build a nest. Um, they build nests with more insulation in colder climates. Um, and all of these sort of um, cost benefit decisions that birds are making all the time um, guided by instinct, but with a lot of other things coming into play. Um, I just got a sense from all the reading that I did for this book that there's a whole lot going on in the birds' lives, a lot more than I had appreciated before. Um, so I had a lot of fun putting this book together. Um, I hope that you have a lot of fun reading it, and um, I hope that it can give you at least some sense of what it's like to be a bird. Thank you. Wonderful. So fascinating. Now, um, again, to ask a question, there is a button below, uh, ask a question and please click on that and enter what you would like to ask David. Um, I will take one here. Uh, what are your favorite three bird adaptations? Oh, <laughs> um, that's a good question. Favorite adaptations. Um, I'll say, so a couple of the things that were the most, some of the most surprising things that I learned as I was researching this book, um, one is that when uh, ground nesting birds like killdeer or ducks, um, when they're sitting on the nest incubating their eggs during that season, the oil that they preen into their feathers changes its chemical composition to something that is odorless, undetectable by mammals. Um, so it makes the nest much harder to find for predators. You know, the birds have they have cryptic coloration and the eggs are camouflaged and the nest is hidden. So it's, it's hard to find visually, but a lot of predators like raccoons and foxes are hunting at night and hunting largely by smell. So this is the bird's way of sort of camouflaging their smell and uh, just an incredible adaptation. Um, let's see, two more. 
Um, uh, I learned that the um, feathers are waterproof because of their structure. It's the it's the arrangement of the barbs, the spacing of the barbs in the feather that works sort of like Gore-Tex. Uh, a drop of water can't flow through the feather. It just sits on top and the barbs are too close together for a drop to go through, but too far apart. They're far enough apart so that the drop just rests on the, on the ridges, on the tops of the barbs and rolls off. So the preen oil is for feather conditioning and probably helps a little bit with water repellency, but it's the structure of the feather that makes it waterproof. Um, let me think, the last one. Um, hmm. I'll have to think about that. Maybe I'll come back okay. to that. <laughs> um, here's a question from uh, a 10 year old. Uh, I had a robin in my tree last year. I read that they would come back to a previous nesting spot. Do you think it will? Ah, um, it's very, uh, yes. If, if that robin survived the winter, it will almost certainly come back to your yard. They might not nest in exactly the same spot. In fact, they probably won't. They'll probably choose a different location. Um, Lots of times the old nest survives through the winter, so there's still some remnants of a nest there, and, and birds, most birds won't reuse a nest. So they'll probably build a new nest in a different place, but it's very likely, as long as that robin survived the winter, it, it will find its way back to your yard and uh, um, build another nest there. Uh, Paula asked, what can we do to attract more birds to our house? Mm, that is a good question. And the um, creating habitat, making your yard um, attractive to birds. Well, obviously <laughs> make it attractive to birds. It will attract more birds. Um, and one way to do that is by um, planting um, uh, plants that are uh, useful to birds. They like, Structure. They like shrubbery. Um, uh, a short mowed lawn is not particularly attractive to birds. So if you can plant gardens, um, wildflowers, shrubs, trees, and native plants are really critical. Um, and the reason for that is that um, something like a, a Norway maple um, it's a European species that's commonly planted here, but it's not native to the US. So no, there are no insects here that have evolved to um, live on a Norway maple. So a Norway maple only has a few species of insects living in it and um, small numbers. Um, where a, a native tree like an oak here in the Eastern US might have 400 plus species of just moth and butterfly larvae that are eating the leaves. So planting native plants provides a lot of food for the birds because it attracts all of the native insects that are that have evolved to live with those plants. David asked, are there birds where the female is more colorful than the male? Yeah, there are a few species. Um, the belted kingfisher is one. Um, the female has a rust colored band across the belly and the, um, the male is just uh, sort of blue, gray and white. Um, but the, one of the best examples is the uh, a family um, or a group of birds called phalaropes. They're, they're kinds of sandpipers. And in the phalaropes, the females are more colorful, they're bigger, um, more, uh, more aggressive and they, um, they take no part in the nesting process other than laying the eggs. The, so they, there's courtship and then the female, the male builds the nest, the female lays the eggs in the nest and then leaves and the male incubates the eggs, raises the young and, um, uh, and then they migrate but the, it's a reverse 
system from uh, what most birds do. Um, so that's the, the, the best example of birds where the females are more colorful than the males is the phalaropes. Stacy asked, did you learn something new about birds while working on this book? Oh, yes, every day. <laughs> I mean, I learn new things about birds all the time anyway, but this book was so eye-opening. Um, just, and that's why it, it turned into this particular book because of all the things I was learning that I was so, so surprised and, and amazed and excited about the things I was learning that, that I wanted to um, put all that into a book. So instead of just being a sort of guide to backyard birds, it became more a book about um, uh, the amazing things backyard birds do. So all these things that I've mentioned, that uh, things, new things that I learned, um, uh, there's another, another little fact that I will uh, add that um, I had heard, my whole life I've heard that birds have a, um, an automatic perching mechanism so that, and a lot of you might have heard this as well, that when they crouch down, that their, their leg bends, so as they crouch, their leg bends and the toes automatically tighten around their perch as the as their ankle bends and releases when they straighten their leg. And it turns out that's not true. Um, the The idea was that folklore was that that's how they stay on a branch while they sleep. That as they crouch down, their toes automatically tighten to grip the branch, and that keeps them in place while they sleep. But the truth is that when birds sleep, they don't grip the branch at all. Their toes just hang loosely around the branch. There is no automatic perching mechanism. And that's where the balance comes in also, that they, they're simply balancing while they sleep. Um, and it makes you think that on a windy night, they may not get a lot of sleep. They, they still manage to stay on their perch, but it must take a lot of, a lot of brain power to uh, stay balanced on a windy night. Susan asked, what, who were some of your resources? Uh, well, a tremendous, you know, I, I have a list of sources in the back of the book. So each, each little essay, um, if it's not sort of common knowledge or general information, I have a list of, of specific research papers that I read that apply to that one essay. And there were many others. So I, and I, I acknowledge in the book, the work of all the, all the dedicated people who's, who have spent their lives researching birds. That's what this book is based on. It's um, all the scientific research. Um, there were a few, a few particular sources that were really helpful, um, and those I've I've mentioned also in the in the sources section. But um, the ornithology textbooks and um, uh, there's a bird anatomy, there's a fairly technical bird anatomy um, textbook that uh, so. But yes, lots and lots of different sources. Carol asked, is the call of a particular bird the same no matter where the bird is, or can variations develop that are specific to a particular group? Oh, as yeah. Um, yeah, the calls are really variable, and I think they there's more and more information coming out, research coming out that um, shows that calls are, um, they carry a lot of information. Um, that, the calls of um, chickadees have a sort of syntax where there's several different types of calls and the way that those calls are put together um, mean different things. The, the sequence of the calls can mean different things. Um, lots of birds develop regional dialects um, so that if you, you know the call note of a bird in one area, it has, it's like, like an accent. <laughs> they, the same call of the same species sounds different in um, Georgia and New England or California. <laughs> um, 
and so yeah there's a tremendous amount of variation um and uh, that's something I've been paying a lot more attention to bird sounds in the last couple of years and I'm uh, just hearing so many things that I never really noticed before as I'm listening to the details. There's a, a lot of subtlety there, a lot of, um, a lot of variations, a lot of calls that I would have overlooked um, that obviously mean something different to the birds. Um, and I had always just sort of um, passed by them as, as just typical calls of that species, but but lots of variation. What adaptations to climate change have you seen in some birds? Ah, uh, um, I guess the biggest thing that I've seen is is just a shifts in the timing of the annual cycles of migration, nesting. Birds are migrating earlier in the spring, later in the fall, um, nesting earlier, um, spending the winter farther north. Uh, it's been a pretty big shift um, just in the 50 years or so that I've been uh, birding. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of species are, are shifting their ranges north. Um, there's been, as far as um, real like physical adaptations. Um, there's a few papers recently that have looked at like 50 years of data of, from banding stations or places where a lot of birds are being measured and they're finding changes in the size, the changes in measurements so that birds are developing longer wings or shorter wings or larger body size, et cetera, um, as a, as a consequence of uh, presumably uh, climate change. Um, and they're still just figuring that out um, and not really knowing whether it's um, if changes in migration habits or changes in migration distance would also be reflected in, in changes in wing shape or um, wing size or body mass or things like that. So. There, there are changes being noticed, and um, it's going to take some time to figure out exactly what's going on. Uh, I think this was a question uh, referring back to when you were talking about uh, the dinosaurs um, and how are modern birds related to those three birds that survived. Oh, yeah. So that was a, a recent study that, that was uh, suggesting that the three birds that survived the meteor impact were um, one, one which is the ancestor of all of the, um, uh, there's a group of, of birds alive now that includes uh, tinamous in South America, ostrich, cassowary, that, that group of really primitive sort of more primitive looking birds. Um, and it's thought that the, the birds that survived the asteroid impact were probably all small ground dwelling birds. So maybe maybe a small tinamou like bird, which is sort of quail like. Um, and then another one um, was the ancestor of all of the modern um, ducks and geese and grouse pheasants. So that whole group, the waterfowl and the upland, upland chicken like birds. Um, one ancestor gave rise to all of those, probably quail-like, and then one, there's one common ancestor to everything else, everything from herons to hawks to finches, warblers, flycatchers, um, and that, that ancestor could have been roadrunner-like or grebe-like or um, any, any number of possibilities. Um, but those are the three the three main branches that have been um, uh, that, that can be discerned in the DNA of modern birds. There's the the ostrich tinamou group, the waterfowl chicken group, and everything else. This question had three votes. Please explain egg coloration. It can't entirely be explained by camouflage. Ah, yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that um, spots on birds' eggs are actually, so 
the pigment melanin strengthens a material. It's, it's why a lot of birds have black wingtips because the, the pigment melanin um, makes the feathers stronger, more resistant to wear and bleaching. And um, uh, so the wingtips um, have to um, survive a lot of stress and exposure. So having black wingtips helps to keep your wings in better shape for longer. That's why most birds, many birds have dark wingtips. Um, melanin is also the pigment that makes dark spots on eggs. And there's a lot of evidence that the, the reason that birds have dark spots on their eggs is as a, a calcium substitute, that um, the melanin helps to strengthen the shell <clears throat> with less calcium. And calcium is the, the thing that makes, a, a, makes the egg shell um, stiff and strong, but the birds, calcium is a limited resource and, and birds um, often have a hard time getting all that they need, especially a female laying eggs. So if she can substitute a little melanin and get away with using less calcium, that's what they do. So that's the reason for a lot of the, um, a lot of the dark spots on eggs. In species like killdeer or ground nesting birds, it's it's obviously very useful for camouflage. Um, but other birds like you know red winged blackbird has a really distinctive, um, striking pattern of black marks, sort of black droplets and streaks across its egg, and that's probably mostly to help strengthen the shell. Well, I've been fascinated. I'm sure our audience is amazed at your knowledge, David. Um, before we wrap up, I'd like to ask you what you're reading or would like to suggest during these challenging times. Yeah, I'm right now I'm reading a book by David Quammen called The Reluctant Mr. Darwin, which is just, it's fascinating. Um, I know a little bit about Darwin, but this is a great great insight and a really interesting story. I was I was supposed to be on a trip to the Galapagos about three weeks ago and that trip obviously was canceled. So reading about Darwin's adventures, it's kind of takes, you know, back to Darwin's time. He he wrote a book, a very popular book apparently about his his uh expedition, his time on the Beagle. And uh um so it feels a little bit like going back to Darwin's time and just reading about his adventure. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was, uh, again, um, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank I wanna you. thank you for being here with us today, uh, as well as everyone else who has joined us for this event. Um, your patronage is what enables us to bring you programming uh, of event uh, uh, like this, and we would love to continue to host these types of events. Please support tonight's author and PMP by buying what it's like to be a bird using the buttons below. Um, click the follow button at the top of your screen to get notifications of other PMP Crowdcast events. Uh, and check out our website for updated event listings. Uh, tomorrow, the soul of an entrepreneur, author David Sachs, and PMP co-owner Bradley Graham discuss small business in uncertain times at 7 p.m. And on Tuesday, a new series, PMP Live at Lunch, continues with author Elaine Welterworth's new book, More Than Enough, in conversation with designer Melody Asani at 1 p.m. Again, thank you, thank you. Um, we wish you all the best and um, stay well read, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you all.